Somebody give Jesus praise in this place today. I said, somebody give Jesus pra praise in this place today. Oh, y'all are sitting on me. You're going to make me work while well, I'm going to work right with you. Somebody give Jesus pra praise in this place today. Come on, if he's brought you through anything, if you've been through anything, if you've seen some mountains and crossed over some valleys, you understand what it is to stand in the house of the God, glad to be in the land of the living, to be seen and not viewed. I'm grateful that there's a God who sits on high and looks down low and cares about little old me. I'm just glad. Is there anybody in the house of God today who can stand and say, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Grateful that I've got breath in my body. Grateful that I've got strength on my bones. Grateful. We can never become so casual. We can never become so casual with the things of God that we allow our comforts to supersede the Christ. We can never allow ourselves to view the church as a cruise ship. It's not about the amenities. You're just glad to be on the team. Anybody glad to be going to heaven? Amen. You remember where you were when God found you. You ain't got to say nothing. I know your neighbor's next to you, and they think you a deacon. They, they, they met you when you were leading the growth track. I, I know they met you when you were a small group leader, but some of us remember way back when. Huh? We remember, where, we remember what we were doing on a Saturday night. It wasn't a Saturday night service. Amen, somebody. Come on in the house of God today. You know, you know what it was, and it is imperative. I was talking with one of the pastors here in between the services, and I was saying how... Uh, one of the things that is warring with the church right now is that in our shift towards casual, many have seen their faith become a casualty. In exchange for comfort, people have left their faith by the wayside in pursuit of themselves and not God. They've confused relatability and relevance with a, a presupposition, an, ex, an exaltation of themselves, so much so that they've seated themselves on the throne. God's got to answer to them. Preacher's talking too long. When's this thing going to be over? I, I, I thought that this was uh, a this kind of church. I thought this was a that kind of church. You see, what you got to understand is that this is the church of Jesus Christ. Right? He died for you to be in it, not the other way around. So he sets the rules. We will carry out the orders. And we're glad to be in his house today. I was glad when they said to me, come let us go into the house of the Lord. So glad. Uh, I, I said it this morning. I'll say it again. I'm Red Bull excited. Triple espresso a lady. Could it be happier to have my face in the place here on the Lord's Day? Can we do something together? Can we honor our pastors Come on, Living Water Church. Y'all got the best. Come on, Living Water Church. Y'all got the best. Let's embarrass them. Let's just, let's honor God's best for such a time as this. Come on. We love you. We love you. Thank God for all that you're doing. Thank you for all that you've done for me, for Jillian, for our baby Naomi. I mean, when Naomi was born, Pastor Jeremiah was like, is she here yet? Is she here yet? Can we come visit? Can we come visit? We'll be there. I'm like, bro, no, wait, hold on. I'll, I'll text you back. It's like happening now, so not, not right now. No, you guys have such a heart for people. You're authentic. You live what you preach. Your family is amazing. Your kids are the cutest. God bless the both of you. You live in water. Give it up for your pastors. I want to honor my wife, my honey boo thing, huh? Love you, Jillian. She's the, the absolute best. I wouldn't want to raise a family with anybody else. Uh, other guys are out here talking about how their wife is a ministry partner, and you know she can sing and slay, and uh, uh, that's great. But, like, I love being at home because church is an hour. 
huh? 90 minutes of the spirit's moving. <laughs> but like we live together and we can have peace in our household. And I'm grateful for that. So I honor you. Honor my chocolate drop. <laughs> Naomi Grace. Love you, sweet thing. Love you, little girl. Thank y'all for praying. She caught a fever last night. And uh, I'm just glad that they're here in the house of the Lord. Can we just celebrate them? <laughs> amen. And amen. And amen. If I was in another church, I'd say now to God who is ahead of my life. We ain't in that church no more. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. No, uh, seriously, to all of you who are watching online, those of you who are streaming, um, I know our launch team, Hill City Church 2B, we're going to launch on April 21st, so we're in the becoming stage. There, a lot of them are watching online. We love you guys. Can y'all just celebrate Hill City Church with me? We love you all the way in Providence, Rhode Island. Thank you so much for releasing me to come. Uh, church, it's an honor and a privilege. I don't take it lightly, any opportunity that I get to stand before God's people and to declare the word of the Lord. But I have to be honest with you that uh, and Pastor Jeremiah, Pastor Bianca, y'all preach, y'all know. Pastor Jill, you know. Um, it, preaching is an awesome responsibility, but it is a tremendous weight because the things that are happening in the world, they hit you too, but you still have to stand before God's people. Uh, I was sharing with the congregation earlier that uh, Hill City Church, we haven't even really become yet. Uh, we've just been meeting and having interest meetings. We've had some Sunday services, and the Lord has brought us some fantastic musicians. And just in, in, at the early stages of 2019, uh, our drummer, 24 years old, college graduate, Berkeley College of Music, passed away. And I know it was just 2019 has come in like a raging flood. And um, I just remember how, uh, you know, we went up to the funeral. Pastor Jill and I drove up to the funeral uh, to be with his family. And young guy, lovable guy. People flew in from all over the country. Musicians, your favorites, have they played for all of your favorites. And um, they were all there, brilliant scholars and wonderful people. And I remember as I was praying the closing prayer, the pastor who was presiding the service invited me to pray the closing prayer. And the altar was flooded with 20-somethings and 30-somethings all lifting their hands to Jesus. We're at a funeral. And the call was made that, hey, if you're in here tonight and you want to be in the same place where our brother has been laid, now is the time to make the decision. And people responded. And as I was praying over them, the Lord just revealed to me that even in his death, this young man was ministering to so many. And the Lord was, was able to receive so many souls that day. And we celebrate how God moved. And I know here at Living Water, we lost a general, a giant in the faith, Mama Kathy. My God, that just, I remember when I got the text from several different ones, I was like, man, um, and you know, I just, I thought to myself, heaven's got a storm coming. <laughs> Jesus, that, that little woman packs a 38 special. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just know that you've been spared a fear that only few of us know. It is something to tower over someone who grips your soul with such terror as she looks into your face as she would say. <laughs> Not words. We honor the memory of Mama Kathy today and uh, so many who have gone before us. Um, I am really, really honored to be a part of this Explore God series along with you. I think you all are doing noble work. I think it is uh, absolutely imperative in the day and age that we live in where people can fact check you as you are speaking that the church of God is not just caught up in the moment of ecstasy, but we've done the work to be excellent in study. And so thank you all so much for participating with your pastors. Uh, thank you for leading us in this direction. My assignment today, I pray that you all will pray with me and for me as I attempt to unpack the question, is Jesus 
really God? Is Jesus really God? Let me pray for you. God, I pray that our time together would be fruitful. Now, God, we pray that you would speak a word to our very souls, something that touches even our spirits, quickening our mortal bodies to life. Let the power of the Holy Ghost move in this place. God, we pray that you would remove every obstacle so that your people can hear what it is that you have to say. Hide me behind the cross and let my words be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and redeemer. And it's the mighty name of Jesus. We all said together, amen. 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 The question for our consideration today uh, calls for context. Calls for context. I think it's important that while we, uh, while we examine this question, that we keep in mind that I believe the heart of the question is in fact noble, but I do think that the question leads us to the wrong starting point. Let me explain what I mean. What I mean by that is uh, when you start the conversation with a question of someone's character, it can be perceived as an attack. You ever been in a place where somebody who didn't know you tried to step to you the wrong way? Huh? Come on, I'm going to talk to this side. Uh, did you, you ever been somewhere where somebody thought that just because you dressed a certain way and speak with a certain diction that you don't know what it is to come from the other side? Y'all saying nothing to me. Yeah, you might be living in the suburbs now, but you ain't been this pretty all your little life. Huh? Talk, talk to me about that. You, you, you've gotten a job now where people report to you, but you remember what it was to do grunt work for a boss who couldn't tie their own shoes. You know what it is to have gone through some things. And so it's important that when people approach us, they don't approach us the wrong way. In the street, we say, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Just understand that I'm saved, but I still got hands. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. You can do all things through Christ. Come on, Kevin, say, you can do all things through Christ except mess with me. Uh, not today, Satan. Not today. Not today, Satan. Uh-uh, don't test what you can't pass. You understand what I'm trying to say? You better have enough in the account if you're going to make a withdrawal on this bank. <laughs> I'm going to show you sneezing from coughing today. I think it's important to start this exploration, this discourse, with an affirmation of the answer. We're asking the question, is Jesus really God? But the answer is not just yes or no. The answer is, who is Jesus really? You see, when we start with a question to find out, not a question to challenge, what we understand, what we now begin to do is we, get, we begin to respect the authority and the capacity of the person that we're addressing. And what I'm saying is you can't just run up on the president irrespective of your feelings toward him. You can't just run up on the president. You're going to get checked before you get through the front door. Talk to me, somebody in this place. So when you have a question of as to the character of who Jesus Christ is, you better ask the question in a way such that you can receive his answer and not superimpose your imagination in its place. What, what I'm saying is that a lot of us are asking the question, or many have asked the question, is Jesus really God? But the truth be told, their motive wasn't in the right place. So we're not going to start with the question. Instead, we're going to start with the questioner. We're going to examine the motives of the person positing the problem in the first place. Because if we can understand what's motivating your question, we can answer you more astutely and more accurately. What I'm saying is I've got a 20-month-old child, my daughter Naomi, and while she is learning to piece words together and weave the, the alphabet together to, to form syllables that, that get her what she needs, more often than not, she just... Ah. <laughs> and what I have to do as her parent is not stoop down to the level of her syllables, but it's rather to stand up and investigate the cause behind her groanings. I, I, if I take the time to examine the cause behind her groanings, I can, I can ascertain what the problem actually is. 
Parents talk to me, you ever tried to, you ever tried, the child's crying, and you try to feed the child, and the child is smacking the food out of your hands, and smacking, and throwing the fit, and head everywhere, and spaghetti's on the floor, and you frustrated because it took you a long time to microwave that spaghetti, and now you are upset with the fact that your spaghetti's on the floor, you just mopped the floor, you just buffed the floor, this is my floor, you don't have a floor, you don't even have a house, you don't have nothing, child, you know, you just find yourself in this kind of exchange with a toddler, you know, they can't put words together, and you just, you about ready to kick them out the house, this is my house. <laughs> what I found is that more often than not, if I can just get a taste of the sauce on my daughter's lips, what she was rejecting with her hand, she accepts with her mouth. What, what, what she, she, see, because she's so caught up in a frenzy, she's so caught up in her own, her own feelings and emotions that she's just rejecting the very thing that she's craving. And so as, as we examine this question, let's turn our attention to the scriptures, to Matthew chapter 16, and let's examine how Jesus walks us through understanding the best way to address the questions and concerns that are on the hearts of people. Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Let's stop right there. As Jesus was having this discourse with his disciples, it's important to realize that he did not ask the question because he did not know who he already was. Uh, Embedded in the question actually is the answer. Jesus says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What you have to understand, if you did any any biblical study, what you would find out is that in Daniel chapter 7, there is a passage of scripture that explains the role of the Son of Man in Jewish thought. Stay with me. What Jesus is actually addressing, Daniel chapter 7, write that down in your notes, study it on your own time. What Jesus is actually saying is that I am the person that the Old Testament was talking about. So what I'm trying to figure out is, since I'm right here in front of you, how come you're listening to everybody else? What he's saying is, I'm standing right here. Who else have you been talking to about me instead of talking to me about me? Uh, The way we say it is this, don't go asking them what I said. If you got a problem with what I said, come and talk to me about what I said. The the way it goes like this, you you shouldn't be going to the pastor saying, Pastor, you should have heard what they were saying about you. Pastor, there's some people in this church that don't like the way that 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 V up on that step. We're not victory church. Why we got a V on our step? Pastor. But it wasn't me, Pastor. It's just what people are saying. Just, just start my herd. I just want you to know that there are a whole lot of people, Pastor, who are unhappy. The question is not whether or not should you tell Pastor Jeremiah what you heard. The question is, how come they feel so comfortable talking to you? See, your problem is you don't have any hope. You don't have any intention of getting the story straight. You just wanted a moment to validate what you already believe to be true. So you allowed the gossip to affirm a fallacy that was already in you. And so what Jesus is doing, put the scripture back up the screen. What Jesus is doing in Matthew chapter 16 is he's, address, he's actually calling out what the disciples were already thinking. What are people saying about me? Who you been talking to? Who you been hanging with? What y'all been talking about? What's going on in your little club? You're supposed to be having a small group. Every time your small group get together, all of a sudden there's a problem. What's going on? Huh? What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the problem? Every time your small group get together, somebody about to lead the church. How come your small group is the only small group that always got somebody about to lead the church? And you're the leader of said small group? Oh, we got a problem. Oh, we got a problem. 
what Jesus does is he asks them, and so their answer reveals what they were thinking about already. Because look at this, what Jesus, what Jesus does, he asks the question, and then what they say, their, their reply in, in verse 14 says that they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, here's the phrase, or one of the prophets. That's significant because what the author of this particular passage of scripture is trying to let us know is that there were many names that Jesus was being called. And what I want to tell you today is that in the world that you and I live in, there are many names that Jesus is being called. There's a story of a theology professor out of California. I've told this story several times. There's a, th- a theology professor out of California. He was standing in a Starbucks, and he's, as he's waiting for his, his, his turn to uh, speak in tongues as he orders this coffee, and he's, he's standing in line, and, and as he's getting ready to make his order, uh, this, this woman is carrying on a conversation in front of him. And, and as this woman is carrying on this conversation, she's, she's talking so much about how Christ has changed a life and Christ has done this and Christ has done that and just Christ, 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 and, and Christ is, is doing everything. And as a the, the theology professor, I mean, this is like your one chance to say something in public and people don't walk away from you. And as he, as he waited for the conversation to finish, he... He introduced himself to the lady and said, excuse me, I, I'm so sorry, I couldn't help but hear, overhear your conversation. I'm, I, I teach theology at a college not too far from here. I just, man, what you were saying about Christ, that's, that's awesome. I'm a believer in Jesus too. And uh, uh, man, it's just so fantastic to be able to have a conversation like this. And the woman stopped him and said, hold on, hold on. Did you say Jesus? He said, yes. Jesus Christ? Yes. Oh, he said, but weren't you just talking about Christ? She said, yeah, I wasn't talking about that Christ. He said, well, what Christ was you talking about? (laughs) She said, I was talking about the spirit of Christ that's in the trees and the birds. And I was talking about Christ is everything that you need him to be. He said, oh, I'll take an Americano. The point of the story is that there are so many times in our lives where if we don't get the story straight, we can think on the surface that we share ideals with somebody. But when you dig a little bit deeper, you'll find out that everybody who's saying Jesus is with their lips isn't worshiping him with their hearts. What, what is happening is that we're understanding that many are going to say, Matthew chapter 7, many are going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not do many wonderful things in your name? And some folk are going to get turned away at the gates and you're going to be standing there saying, man, they didn't make it. And some folk are going to make it into the gate. She's going to be like, man, they made it. (laughs) You're going to be standing in the waiting like, wait, wait, hold on. He still owe me $20. (laughs) Hey, Peter, you think I can get my $20? (laughs) What Jesus came to do, he didn't come. Jesus didn't come to win arguments. Church, so often when we discuss this question, is Jesus really God? The the goal, if we're honest, the motivation is to vanquish anyone who says anything opposite us. The goal so often is to have a discussion, is to, to Google Ravi Zacharias and to find that three second, that 30 second clip where he, he just breaks it down and the atheist is crying. Boom, in your face. See, ah, gotcha. And notice what Jesus does. He doesn't begin a theological treatise on his deity, divinity. He doesn't begin an ontological discussion on the reality of his existence. He doesn't even get into philosophical wrestling with these disciples. All he does is ask a question and listen. And in listening, he was able to hear what people were saying, what people were still caught up with. I, I'm running out of time, but I got to leave this with you. As he was, could you put the, the scripture back up on the screen? As, he, as they were talking, they said, say, some say you are John the Baptist. Skip Elijah and jump straight. And still others, Jeremiah. Now, come on. 
Jeremiah had been dead a long time ago. What do you mean some people think you might be Jeremiah? Forget it. Forget it. Maybe you believe in the resurrection. Maybe you believe in ghosts coming back. Okay, fine. But John the Baptist? Quit playing. John the Baptist? Y'all were there when John baptized Jesus. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. Don't you go nowhere. Come back here. John, you were there when John was standing in the water baptizing folk and Jesus rode up on him and John was like, oh, snap. Here go that dude. I wasn't ready. And John rather wants to be baptized by Jesus. Everybody's standing there. And John says, no, 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 you got to baptize me. And Jesus says back to John, no, this must be done so that all righteousness must be fulfilled. And everybody standing there watched as John dunked Jesus in the water. Jesus comes up, the sky opens, a voice from heaven is booming. If you don't hear the voice, at least you hear the thunder. <laughs> and a dove came and descended on his shoulder. That John. That's the John, the John who was imprisoned. The John who was beheaded. That's the John that y'all think? No, no, no. That's impossible. I'll tell you what's really going on here. Sometimes there are some people who want to bring up some dead things just to keep you at bay because they don't want you to see, they don't want to see you become who you're going to become. There are going to be some people in your life who want to bring up stuff that Christ has already buried, but they want to bring it up because they don't want to see you become the, all that God has designed and destined for you to become. So they'll throw some dead stuff on your new life. Some say Elijah. Why? Why Elijah? Elijah is a significant Old Testament character. But you see, the people who were trying to name Jesus, they were trying to put the name of Elijah on Jesus. It's because they knew if Jesus is just Elijah, then we can listen to his message and go on about our lives. But we don't have to submit to him as Lord. If the truth be told, I got to wrap up. If the truth be told, a lot of us... A lot of those who are asking this question, it's not really a question of is Jesus really God because that's a, that's a theological conversation about substance and likeness and existence and we could go, we could go there. You could consult the Bible Project. They've, got, they've done a fantastic series on it. You could, uh, con you could consult the Bay Mob podcast. They've done a fantastic work. You could consult N.T. Wright and his writings on Christology. You could, you could look at Larry Hurtado and his explanation on how the early church uh, understood the divinity and the deity of Jesus Christ. Oh, we could go to seminary if you want to go to seminary, but if truth be told, I, I don't believe the issue is a question of the definition. I think the real issue that many people have when they're asking, is Jesus really God. I think the real issue is that they're not ready to get up off the throne. If the truth be told, we like telling Jesus to what kind of Messiah he ought to be. We like establishing definitions for the Christ that fit our current paradigm such that transformation doesn't have to happen. We're already who we want to be. Created in our own image, formed in our own likeness. We're cool with who we've become so far. So we don't need Jesus walking up in here telling us to feed the hungry, telling us to clothe the naked, telling us to visit those in prison. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Telling us to visit those in prison. When Jussie Smollett, Jussie Smollett gets accosted in Chicago, Jesus would have been the good Samaritan that stopped on the, on the road and cared and dressed his wounds. Jesus wouldn't have been asking about his orientation this is the Jesus who said to love your enemies but we're voting for bombs and denying bread for the people that are suffering in our cities See, what you got to understand is that the, the gospel is not left wing or right wing those are just two sides of the same bird The gospel is an eternal declaration of God's love intersecting with the earth. 
It's about the change, the transformation, the metamorphosis of a dead soul into a living spirit. I'm talking in here today. What I'm trying to, if you listen, I can help you get some freedom. What I'm trying to tell you is that if you would put down your theology for just a moment. If you would take up an ethic of love. If you would concern yourself with the well-being of your neighbor. You could do more for the gospel than any apologetics conference. Oh, y'all can say amen on that one. What I'm trying to tell you is that the goal of the gospel is not to win over and against you. The goal of the gospel is to win you over. The goal of the gospel is to seek justice, to desire mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. To make it your aim, to lead a quiet life, to work with your hands. And to give glory to God. To let your light shine before men. So they might see your good works. And then give glory to God. Ain't nobody coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Because you convince them intellectually. As quickly as the thought comes. So quickly it goes. It is the goodness of God. That leads people to repentance. So start doing some good. What we need is a church who can answer the questions and the groanings. Hey, the questions and the groanings of people, not with an intellectual answer, but oh, taste and see that the Lord, he is good and his mercies endure forever. That he's been faithful to a thousand generations and to a thousand generations, he's never failed. What I'm saying in this place today is that there is a God in heaven who sits on high and looks down low. He's got all power in his hand and he will exercise it on your behalf. He will exercise it on your behalf. But what he's looking for is partnership. What he's looking for are people who will be bold enough to take him at his words, that if you believe in Jesus, then the works that he did, you will also do. And even greater than these will you also do for those that believe. That you'll lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. That you're called to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse lepers, to heal blind eyes, to open deaf ears. We're talking about God. We're talking about the one who calm raging seas. We're talking about the one that the winds and the waves all bet y'all ain't saying nothing to me. We're talking about the one who stops the sun in the sky. We're talking about the one who never allows the sun to miss a day of work. We're talking about the one. His name is Jesus. Jeremiah, I got to close. We got to go home. It's the Super Bowl. The brothers in here are clapping, but they ain't really, really clapping. They, you know what I'm saying? Like, they clapping, but they kind of like, amen. Hey, oh, there you go again. See, y'all encouraging them. Y'all encouraging them. Let me leave you with this, and I got to go. We got to get out of here. What, what, what's interesting about this story, it's right there in the first verse. If you put the scripture back on the screen, what's interesting about this story is that Jesus, this, he, this Jesus, he, he waits until they come to the region of Caesarea Philippi to have this conversation. What's interesting is that he doesn't do this in Jerusalem. He doesn't do it in Bethlehem, Bethphage, He doesn't do it in Capernaum. He doesn't do it in Nazareth. He doesn't even do it in Galilee. Jesus waits until they come to Caesarea Philippi. The the interesting thing about Caesarea Philippi is that it is 25 miles north and east of the northernmost uh, Israelite city at that time. What that means is he was out in the boondocks in the middle of nowhere. And in the middle of nowhere, he's actually in a land that is filled with idols If you did a study on Caesarea Philippi, you'd be be shocked 
at the religious history of this city. They, they worshiped everything but God. And it's in this place that Jesus chooses to broach the conversation of his divinity, not for his sake, but for the sake of his followers, as if to say that the best theological conversations don't happen in the comforts of the church. The best theological conversations happen in the presence of the people that need the incarnation of the Savior the most. If you want to have a conversation with somebody about eternity, how about you go to their house? How about you help them with their kids? How about you volunteer your time at the school, not with the pretty lawn and the manicured, that they got the mulch and the, the, they got the nice TV. How about you volunteer your time with the kids who are getting kicked out? How about you volunteer your time with the folks who are on their way to the, they're literally locked and loaded in the school to prison pipeline. How about you have some compassion on the people who can't seem to get a job because they've got a, a criminal record. And so instead of being able to come out of prison and turn their life around, they come out of prison and have to go back to the same trap and corner that they came from because no one else will give them an opportunity. You want to have a theological conversation. How about you talk to the prostitute instead of shaking your head at her? Oh, God. Y'all can play. We got to go. But Jesus waits till Caesarea Philippi. He waits till they were out. He waited till they were outside of the comforts and familiarity of home to have a very, very sobering conversation. Not, not in an effort to catch sinners in their own lies. Because that would dishonor them. That would rob them of their dignity. That would be to embarrass them. Jesus wasn't a finger pointer. What Jesus did is he brought, he brought the discomfort to the disciples, not the other way around. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to embarrass nobody. He was trying to include people. I'm not talking about an inclusion gospel. I'm talking about a gospel that goes after the one. The song we just sang, that does, he doesn't leave the one behind. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he? If we were in other, ain't he all right? <laughs> ain't he all right? <laughs> but isn't he wonderful? Isn't he the God that doesn't care what you've done? He, all he wants is for you to accept what he's already done for you. Isn't this, y'all can stand on your feet, I'm done. Isn't this the Jesus who left the comforts of heaven, stepped down into the brokenness of earth, they hung him high, they stretched him wide, his head was hung in the locks of his shoulders, his side was pierced with a spear, they laid a crown of thorns upon his head just so that you and I could have a shot at eternity. He wiped the slate clean Though our sins were as scarlet, he washed us whiter than snow. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thus says the Lord. I believe there are some people in here today that the Lord God, God bless you. Thank you. I believe that there are some people in here today. God's been tugging on your heart for a while now. God's been trying to get your attention. And each time you've used a doubt or a question or, or something that hasn't been fully worked out yet as a way to stave God off. Come on, like a, like a scared boyfriend, his girlfriend's asking him for commitment and you've just been hemming and hawing and coming up with every excuse in the book. Oh, I think, you know, why we gotta have titles? I mean, can't we just be together? Can't we just have this? Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this, this is what, no. And Jesus is trying to, he's trying to get your attention. He's trying to get you to understand that he's not caught up with the title of, of Lord and Savior. That's just who he is. He can't be anything other than who he is. I'm Tim. That's just what it is. I can never hope to fill the shoes of Jeremiah, but I can put mine on. 
I can be who God has called me to be, and you can be who God has called you to be, and maybe you don't have all the theology worked out yet. I got news for you. The oldest among us don't have it all worked out yet. The point isn't to work it out. The point is to continue to do the work. And I believe that if in this moment, we're about to pray, if in this moment, I believe at the very core of my being, I believe in this moment, if you will give God a shot, just, just give him a shot. I know people have failed you. I know preachers are acting crazy. Preachers of LA on TV, just living all kinds of crazy. I'm not talking about them. Don't give them a shot. I, I understand you're upset with them, but I'm asking you to give God a shot. And I think you're in a great church to see the actual hands and feet of Jesus in real life. I think you got some pastors who can lead you in a growing relationship with this Jesus Christ. So, so just give God a shot. And I promise, I believe with everything that's within me that your life will be transformed from now till eternity if you're in this room today and you want to make that commitment come on if you're in this room today and you want to make that commitment I want to see hands all over this place every eye closed every head bowed if you're in this place today and you believe that Jesus is worth giving a shot come on some of you are in here some of you in here and maybe you've given Jesus a shot before but maybe you fell off. Maybe you strayed away. And maybe your question is, man, I don't know if I'm worth giving another shot to. I, I, I don't know if Jesus should take another chance on me. Can I just tell you that he's really God enough to handle your mistakes? He's really God enough to handle the fact that you fell off, that you fell down, that you jumped off the wagon a time or two or 12, that he's, he's God enough to care and to carry your burdens. Every head bow, every eye close. Would you pray the words of this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for living your life. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you for all of your sacrifice. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died. You were buried. And on the third day, you rose. And Jesus, I am willing to let you lead my life. Now let me pray for you. God, I pray for your people. Anybody who's prayed that prayer in this place, God, I pray for anybody who prayed that prayer today. I pray that the blessing of heaven would come upon their life so strong that you would start confirming and reaffirming, reassuring their confession of faith with supernatural acts by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would move in miraculous ways and transform the hearts and minds of everyone under the sound of my voice. We pray your blessing upon this church, upon these leaders in Jesus' mighty name. We all said together.